This is the story of how Tony Stark became Iron Man. Anthony Tony Stark was an inventor, genius, billionaire, and American patriot. After Tony graduated from college, his parents, Howard and Maria Stark, were killed in a terrible accident. Tony was left in charge of their multi-billion dollar technology company, Stark Industries. Stark Industries was well known for its development and manufacturing of advanced weapons and defense technologies. With his unique, brilliant mind, Tony quickly stepped up as chairman of Stark Industries. He invented countless weapons and received numerous awards. Although Tony was a sharp businessman, he couldn't run the company on his own. He hired an assistant, Pepper Potts, who kept him organized and on schedule. Obadiah Stain, a friend of Tony's father, stepped in as Tony's mentor and business partner. Tony enjoyed building weapons and showing them off, but he didn't enjoy the formal events that came with his new job. When he received the esteemed Apogee Award, Tony decided to skip the event. He sent Obadiah to accept the award for him. Well, I'm not Tony Stark. Uh, <laughs> but if I were Tony, I would tell you how honored I feel and uh, what a joy it is to receive this very prestigious award. The best thing about Tony is also the worst thing. He's always working. After the award ceremony, Pepper confronted Tony in his lab. You are supposed to be halfway around the world. Tony was supposed to be in Afghanistan, presenting his new Jericho missile to a group of high-ranking military officers, alongside his friend and the military liaison to Stark Industries, Lieutenant Colonel James Rhodes. But Tony just smirked at Pepper. I thought with it being my plan and all, that it would just wait for me. Tony packed up his equipment and hopped on his personal plane. In Afghanistan, he presented his newest technology to Rhodes and the group of military men on a ridge that overlooked a vast expanse of mountains. Is it better to be feared or respected? And I say, is it too much to ask for both? With that in mind, I humbly present the crown jewel of Stark Industries' Freedom Line. Tony signaled toward the mountains and a large missile launched into them. The blast from the impact was so powerful that it blew all the men's hats off. Tony's audience praised him, and they headed back to the base. But as they were driving, a huge explosion hit Tony's truck. When Tony woke up, he was in a dark cave with a man who called himself Yinsen. Tony took in his surroundings. Then he looked down. There was a round metal device in the center of his chest, right over his heart. He shot a look at Yinsen. What is this? Yinsen explained that Tony had been captured and imprisoned by the terrorist group that had caused the car explosion. The shrapnel had wounded Tony. The metal piece in his chest was an electromagnet keeping him alive. Suddenly, a menacing man named Raza walked into the cave and demanded Tony build him the Jericho missile. But Tony was never one to be bullied. I refuse. Raza immediately summoned his gang, who forcefully dragged Tony outside the cave. Raza showed Tony that he already had all the equipment Tony would need to build the missile. He wanted him to start work immediately and promised to free Tony once the weapon was delivered. Tony didn't believe a word Raza said, but he knew he had to build something. Back in the cave, Tony started assembling, welding, and deconstructing the equipment he was provided. He threw a metal piece behind him. Okay, we don't need this. Yinsen realized that what Tony was building did not look like a missile. Tony pointed at the work in front of him. That's because it's a miniaturized arc reactor. I got a big one powering my factory at home. Yinsen was very interested in the arc reactor. He wanted to know the details, how it worked, and what it would generate. Tony enthusiastically explained. If my math is right, I don't know what it is. Three gigajoules per second. 
Yinsen realized that meant the arc reactor could run Tony's heart for 50 lifetimes. Tony shot Yinsen a sideways glance and smiled. Or something big for 15 minutes. Tony pulled up a blueprint in the cave. It showed his plan to build a metal suit with the arc reactor in the center of its chest plate. This is our ticket out of here. Yinsen believed Tony and decided to help him build the iron suit. For the next few days, Tony and Yinsen worked on the armored suit around the clock. Finally, it was ready to be fitted. Tony stepped into the suit and repeated Yinsen's directions to sneak out of the cave. He had only one shot at getting out. 41 steps straight ahead, then 16 steps, that's from the door, fork right, 33 steps, turn right. With a few last-minute adjustments, the suit was activated and Tony escaped from the cave. Raza's henchmen immediately confronted him, but Tony held up his arm, ready to fight. My turn. In his new armored suit, Tony took down Raza and his men using fire blasts from his arms. Then he rocketed away from Raza's headquarters. But his suit ran out of power, and he crashed in the desert miles away, where a military helicopter eventually found him and picked him up. Tony was welcomed back by Pepper, Obadiah, his supporters, and several news reporters at a press conference. He addressed the group with his usual wit and charm. I came to realize that I have more to offer this world than just making things to blow up. And that is why, effective immediately, I am shutting down the weapons manufacturers business. The crowd went wild. Cameras snapped and reporters yelled out questions. The news of Stark Industries no longer making weapons was a huge deal. Outside the press room, Obadiah confronted Tony. He was concerned about Tony's new decision regarding the business, but Tony stood by it. We're not doing a good enough job. We can do better. We're going to do something else. Like what? I think we should take another look into arc reactor technology. Tony opened his shirt and showed Obadiah his own arc reactor. It works. Tony didn't listen to Obadiah's objections and started working on his new initiative, a bigger and better iron suit that would save lives. For this, he consulted his other assistant, an artificially intelligent computer system named Jarvis. Jarvis, you up? I'd like to open a new project file. Till further notice, why don't we just keep everything on my private server? I don't want this winding up in the wrong hands. Tony worked day and night on his project, spending all his time in the lab with Jarvis. Things got a little tense, and Tony snapped at his computer assistant. Okay, I'm sorry. Am I in your way? Pepper grew concerned. She went down to the lab to check on Tony. I've been buzzing you. Did you hear the intercom? Tony stopped working, looked up, and reassured Pepper that he was fine. He was just busy building his new suit. Tony's armor quickly progressed. Soon he had a powerful iron suit with an onboard weapon system. It still needed something to make it look sleek and cool. He rubbed his chin and called out to Jarvis. Tell you what, throw a little hot rod red in there. Next, Tony concentrated on the jets in his boots and the repulsors in his gauntlets. He wanted his suit to fly. Activate hand controls. Tony successfully hovered, but without warning, he was thrown across the room. Test unsuccessful. Nothing could stop Tony. He worked harder than he ever had before, and it paid off. He perfected the repulsors in both his gauntlets and boots. He lifted the suit off the ground. Yeah, I can fly. Then he looked over at Jarvis with a grin on his face. Sometimes you gotta run before you can walk. The roof of his lab opened, and Tony swiftly took off into the night sky. He maneuvered the suit like a pro. He arrived back at his lab. As he went in for a landing, he called out to Jarvis. Kill power. But instead of setting down gracefully, Tony smashed through three floors and into his garage, finally crash landing right on top of one of his flashy cars. While Tony continued to improve his suit, he discovered that Obadiah had betrayed their friendship by selling weapons to Tony's enemy, Raza, and bribing Raza's terrorist group to take Tony's life. Tony felt angry and guilty that his weapons were being used to harm others. He flew to the village in his shiny red and gold iron suit, armed and ready to take out the bad guys. When he arrived, 
he immediately started hitting them with his repulsors, sending the villains crashing into walls. With a final blast from his gauntlets, Iron Man took down the last bad guy and heroically looked up at the villagers. He's all yours. Then he headed back home. But Tony didn't know that while he was taking down Raza's henchmen and saving the village, Obadiah had hired his own scientists and was secretly working to create an enormous and powerful iron suit of his own. Obadiah instructed his team. Set up Sector 16 underneath the arc reactor, and I'm going to want this data masked. Recruit our top engineers. I want a prototype right away. He specifically directed one of the scientists. William, here is the technology. I've asked you to simply make it smaller. He wanted to build his own iron suit to get rid of Tony and take over Stark Industries. Since Tony knew Obadiah was up to no good, he sent Pepper to hack into his computer and find out exactly what Obadiah had planned. Tony soon realized he was going to have to fight his mentor and friend. He looked up at Pepper. I'm going to find my weapons and destroy them. Pepper shook her head. Tony, you know that I would help you with anything, but I cannot help you if you're going to start all of this again. Tony was upset. There is nothing except this. I just finally know what I have to do. And I know in my heart that it's right. Decked out in his red and gold armor, Tony took off. Tony lured Obadiah, who was suited up as the Iron Monger, to the top of the Stark Industries building. He wanted to fight him somewhere no innocent civilians would get hurt. As he attacked the Iron Monger with his repulsors, he shouted commands to Jarvis. Divert power to chest hurt. Obadiah slammed Iron Man to the ground and stood over him. Nothing is going to stand in my way. Least of all, you. Tony once again instructed Jarvis. Take me to maximum altitude. The two iron giants threw each other around until finally Pepper overloaded the large reactor in the lab below them, unleashing a massive electrical surge. The iron monger fell into the exploding reactor and was destroyed. The next day, at a press conference, both reporters and members of the public had a lot of questions about Stark Industries and the iron suits they saw battling in the night sky. One of the reporters referred to the suit as Iron Man. Tony thought for a moment and turned to his friends. Iron Man, that's kind of catchy. It's got a nice ring to it. I mean, it's not technically accurate. The suit's a gold titanium alloy. Then Tony became serious and addressed the press. Truth is... I am Iron Man. As the room went wild, Tony Stark grinned. He had learned that it was necessary to protect the public. And as the invincible superhero Iron Man, he would do just that. Iron Man.